So yesterday we talked about how we can't really compare standard deviations themselves to determine whether one set has more variation than another set. And I think the last thing I gave you was a coefficient of variation. Did I give you that? That's one way to do it. It's not a very practical way because we don't use it for anything else. It, it basically just changes the standard deviation into a percentage based on the mean. It says how much your standard deviation is varying comparatively with another set. Uh, now what we're going to do today is come up with the last thing we did on standard deviation, which was I gave you some example and said uh, find out what percent of the data falls within these two numbers. Do you remember that? We found the distance and we divided by the standard deviation and said, oh, you are three standard deviations away. Therefore, 99.7% of your data falls within that range. That's what we did last time. That process right there is a very good process to let us calculate what's called a z-score. We're going to talk about that and what a z-score will do is allow us to compare two uh, data sets directly to see which one has more variation and that's an important thing for us to do. So that's kind of our, our idea for section 3.4 here. So we're on 3.4, we're talking about, this is going to be called measures of relative standing. And what we're going to be doing is comparing measures between or within data sets. That's what the relative standing means. And to use this, we calculate what's called the z-score. Now, this is going to look really familiar to you because I already previewed this information like on Wednesday. The last time we did this, we, we actually calculated the z-score. I just didn't call it the z-score. I said, let's find out how many standard deviations away from the mean we are. That idea is a z-score. So when I ask you on your first test, which I will, what is a z-score? You are going to tell me a z-score is the number of standard deviations away from the mean. Or more specifically, the number of standard deviations a particular data value is away from the mean. Are you all clear on that? Okay, don't say I didn't tell you. It's on the video now. I can prove it. I can prove it's on there. That's going to be on your, on your test. So I'm going to ask you, what's a z-score? And you go, oh, I don't know. You go, okay. It's the number of standard deviations away from the mean a data value is. So z-score. And I'm going to say it right here. The z-score is the number of standard deviations that a value, a specific data value is away from the mean. By the way, uh, what letter do we use to represent our data values in this class? N would be the number of data values we have. I'm talking about particular data values themselves. X's. So the number of standard deviations, a data value, that's our, our X's here, is away from the mean. Now I can't give you one specific uh, mean because we can deal with either a sample or a population. Now, in this case, unlike the standard deviation, you calculate the z-score exactly the same for the sample as well as for the population version of a z-score, okay? So it's not like you have to do anything different. Uh, really, the, the standard deviation, that has the major difference in there for this class. You, you do the divided by n for the um, um, population, sorry, distracted and you do the n minus 1 for the sample. You got that? So that's, that's a difference there. For a z-score, it really doesn't make any difference. So the, the number of standard deviations away from the, the mean, that gives us our z-score. 
So for our sample, and for our population, it's going to look a little bit different, but the way you calculate it is identical. So for our sample, we'll have z, thanks, well, z-score. Here's how z-score works. What we did last time is we found the distance between a data value and the, the mean. How can you find a distance between two numbers? Say it louder. Subtract. Yeah, you're going to subtract them. Do you remember doing that? We subtracted. I, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but we subtracted the large value minus the mean. We got that distance there. I think it was 24 or something. That was from, from last time. So we're going to subtract. And we say, OK, take your data value, subtract your mean. By the way, the, the, for the sample, the mean is going to be what? It's star. Good. So in our example from last time, we subtracted that that value. By the way, what was the, let's, let's do that again so you can kind of see it. Can you tell me what range I gave you? From last time? Don't look like it once. You gave 34 and 58. 58. 58 was the upper? Or 58 yeah, 58 was the, was the upper. And 24 was your... 24? Well, 24 was your range, but your two numbers were 34 and 58. Your mean is 34. Okay, what's the lower number? 10. 34. 10. There we go. When I gave you this example last time, we had a range of numbers from 10 to 58, and the question I asked you, maybe Creative will answer your question from last time as well. Um, how do you find out what percentage of data falls within that range? The first thing you have to do is consider your mean and your standard deviation. Your mean was 34 and your standard deviation was how much? Okay. And what we did was we said, we want to find out how many standard deviations fit in this range and how many standard deviations fit in this range. In order to do that, the easy way, instead of just adding, going 8 plus 8 plus 8, uh, let's say, whatever. You don't want to do that if it takes too much time and you're not going to be accurate if it doesn't go in exactly. Because you go, what if it listed at 59? You go 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 1? That doesn't really work that well, okay? We want to have like at least a decimal here. So instead of doing that, we go, all right, let's figure out how far this is from that. And in order to do that, folks, how do you figure out how far 34 is from 58? That's what we're doing here. We're taking the x value, which in this case is 58, we're subtracting our mean, which in this case is 34, that gives us 24. That's the distance between those two numbers. You with me on that? Now, how do you calculate how many standard deviations fit in there? That's a division problem. You go, oh, okay, this is the distance, the standard deviation is 8. How many times does 8 go into 24? That gives me the number of standard deviations it is away. How many times is that here? So we're going to divide by, what do you suppose over here? Not three, because this is specific yeah, sample. Right. The standard deviation, that's right. So we divide by, I'm sorry, uh, eight, and we get three. So our standard deviation is eight, we divide by that, we get our, our three out of that. So here we'll divide by our standard deviation. Again, we're using the letter S because we have a sample. But you're going to calculate the population exactly the same way. You'll still have a Z. You'll still have an x, because the data value doesn't change its variable. But instead of x bar, what are you going to have for a population, ladies and gentlemen, so you, you know this already? Mm -hmm. Mu, yeah, that's right. We have fun with mu. And instead of s, what are you going to have? Canon. Say canon? Say <laughs> the canon, yeah, that's right. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, the canon. <laughs> yeah, it's a sig lowercase sigma. That's what you have. So we take our distance between here. That's x minus x bar. We divide by the standard deviation. In this case, it was 8. I think I said 3 earlier, but I meant 8. Uh, you divide by 8 because that's telling you how many standard deviations fit in that range of numbers. So here we divide by standard deviation in, in each case. Now, notice that with a z-score, does it have to go in exactly for you to get an answer? And that's no. What if this had been 59? You'd get 25 here. 8 doesn't go to 25, but you will get the decimal. And that's nice. We can use that. We can't use, oh, it adds up three times, but then we don't know the rest. That doesn't really help us statistically okay. So this, this z-score idea, we've actually already, we've already done it. 
We've already done this idea. We did this last time. It's just now we have a name for it. It's called the Z-score. It gives you the number of standard deviations that a data value is away from mean. Calculated the same way for population and sample, just uh, different letters here. And what this does is it allows you to really easily compare uh, the variation of two different samples or two different sets or populations. So this allows comparison of the variation in two different samples or two different populations. two different samples in two different or two different populations, does that mean you have to compare a population to a population? Or can you compare a population to a sample? No, you can. Yeah, you can you can. If you know the the sample or the, know the whole population, sure. If you know those Z scores, you can say this population has more spread than, than the sample does. Um, it'd be interesting to find out if you had a sample and you had a population of well, for instance, let's say that Merced College was the population and this class was a sample. It would be very interesting to consider the z-score of you guys for some characteristic and the z-score of the population if you had all that data. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see if they were exactly the same or not. If you were a random sample, it should be pretty close. Right? It should be. Um, we'll talk about sample size later on, but our sample size would be big enough for us to hopefully get that. Um, now, is it going to be exact? No. But it should be hopefully pretty close. We'll also do some other things statistically that will allow us to make that transition between samples and populations more easily, where we can say, okay, even though we have a sample, this data can represent a population very, very well. So to answer, I, I really spoke a long time about answering the question, but uh, yeah, you can. We'll do a lot more than that, but yeah, you can. Let me give you an example of doing this, okay? So we're going to compare the heights of two people. Now this data is old. Do you know what the you know Miami Heat, right? Do you play do you, do you watch basketball at all? You see, I don't. I know I don't like basketball. But I know a little bit about basketball because I used to play it until my coach cut me from basketball in sixth grade. <laughs> he got mad. He goes, You got a lot of heart, kid, but man, you suck. <laughs> Jeez, sixth grade, come on. It's short and fat. It can be short. Anyway, made me cry a little bit. <laughs> Anyway, so we're going to compare the heights of two different people. Now, we're not going to compare the heights directly. We're going to compare the heights of Shaquille O'Neal. You know who he is? Yes. He used to play for the Miami Heat, unless I'm mistaken, didn't he? Who's he play for now? Tired. Is he? <laughs> plays for. Looks like for Boston and LA. Seriously? You know all about this. It's pretty good. But he used to play for the Heat, for sure, right? Yeah. Okay, good. And I know this one's true. Lyndon B. Johnson used to be a president. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> good on that. We're going to compare the heights of those two people. Now, if you compared the heights of Lyndon B. Johnson and Shaquille O'Neal, you can definitely say that Shaquille O'Neal, he's taller, right? He was 85 inches tall. Which, which, that's pretty tall. Um, now, Lyndon B. Johnson, he was only 70, let's see, 70, 75 inches tall. So clearly Shaquille O'Neal was taller than him.